Welcome to the podcast on the Chinese society and cultural productions in the Xi Jinping era. This podcast presents research conducted at SWPS University, Poland, as part of Work Package 2, Society and Culture of the European Union's Horizon Europe Research Grant entitled China Horizons, Dealing with the Resurgent China. Joining me online are members of the SWPS University research team. Uh, let me introduce them to you. First of all, it's František Reismuller, PhD. As part of this project, he is doing research on the Chinese film industry and is joining us from China, where he is now on his research trip. František, hello. Hello, everybody. Okay, and next in the line is Piotr Mahayek, PhD candidate, and he is responsible for research in literature. And he is joining us from the UK, where he is meeting with visiting Chinese writers and critics. Hello, Piotr. Hello, hi, everybody. Last but not least, we have Anna Grzyszkiewicz, PhD, and she is working on the field of theater. And together with me, she will be traveling to China next week to take part in the Wuzhen Theater Festival. Hello, Anna. Hello, everybody. And my name is Marcin Jacobi. I'm a professor in Sinology, and I will be telling you a little about Chinese visual arts. So let's start. František, you are now at the Pingyao International Film Festival, and you have already seen some of the films at the festival. What are your first insights about the industry? How has this survived the COVID-19 restrictions? And uh, what are the new economic challenges that it faces? I must say, according to the festival I'm actually right now attending, it seems the success of survival was quite high. The festival is small. It's only its seventh edition. It was established in uh, 2017 by the famous uh, Chinese director Jia Zhangke. And it survived COVID quite well. Actually, it never stopped. Unlike many other festivals in Europe, last year, as well as the year before, uh, the sixth and the fifth editions were held here in Pinyao only for the domestic audience, without any international participants, but still, it was live and it was in person. So that's already a very good message for the, for the Chinese film industry, I would say. This year, there are actually 23 Chinese movies being screened, and all of them are from this year or the year 2022. So uh, that's also quite, quite a big success, because it seems that... Um, the film industry survived the pandemic period and films are still being made and the, 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 the industry is, is generally active. You mentioned that um, previous editions during the pandemic had no international guests. How about now? Did you see many international guests at the festival this year? Speaking about the audience, actually, no. I kind of felt I'm the sole European there. But speaking about the films, actually, uh, there are films from various uh, co-productions, from Germany, France, even Czech Republic, actually. And, you know, generally the Pinyao Film Festival is kind of targeted to the, like, let's say, margins of the film industry. So they try to feature films uh, from Eastern Europe or Southeast Asia and places, places like this, uh, besides China, of course. So, yeah, this, this is that there are actually films from, from uh, these regions here, yeah. In your research, you showed that the pandemic, the three years of pandemic restrictions were actually quite hard for the film industry. There were massive losses of uh, box office income and there were other issues, also mounting pressure on the propaganda side to fit in with the official discourse. And you did discuss uh, the question of the independent film sector in China, which many people say is more or less gone. Can you fill us in a little bit on whether there are any independent films created in China now and what kind of creative freedom do filmmakers still enjoy? Speaking about independent films, uh, it's quite important to first define what independent means in China because it might be a bit different than how we conceive this term uh, in the West. Generally in the West, we think about independent films as something made outside the main industry, let's say Hollywood in America, right? But in uh, China, it might be a little different. Of course, when independent movies started being made in China, it was at the end of the 1980s or in the 1990s when you know the, uh, the, 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 the authors, they actually got the technical chance to create something outside of the state-owned film studios. They got digital cameras, they got maybe even they, their own production companies. But nowadays, 
independent would mean something more like outside of the film censorship. So something that is made in China, but it is not submitted to censorship. I must say that something like that rarely exists in China at the moment. And that is because in 2017, there was this new film production law implemented in China that actually forbids anything that is not approved by the censorship bureau, by the film bureau, by the different administrations on different levels, be it uh, the cities or, or the provinces. Uh, so nothing, nothing like that can be actually publicly screened in China. And there is a big like half a million UN fine uh, if you violate this law. So if independent in China means something that is outside the censorship, outside of the state controls system, then it must be said that nothing like independent exists in China at the moment. But there is still some artistic freedom. We are very much interested in social topics that are tackled by filmmakers and by other artistic creators. So can you tell us of all the films that you watched recently in China, what other topics that you especially think might be interesting for us to understand today's China and all the changes that China society has been going through? What are the things that actually you noticed? Yeah, that is actually important to say that there is still some space to operate within the, within the system or, you know, within the censorship system. And as it is the case with many Chinese laws, they are not really explicit. While maybe in the West we work uh, on a principle that what is not forbidden is actually not forbidden, here it is not quite clear what is forbidden. So it is true that uh, Chinese filmmakers do describe different aspects from different like society strata or different uh, social problems, be it poverty, be it some, you know, like alienation of, of, of a person uh, from the, let's say, stress of, you know, the money or and, 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 and the, you know, like capitalist uh, thing that, 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 that is quite modern here. Maybe I would, you know, give you a few examples of, of how it is difficult to operate within the system. I want to mention three or four movies here. The first one is quite famous and it has a huge success in, in the festivals in the West, like the Berlin in, in Berlin, in Germany. And that is a film called Return to Dust from Leroy Eating. It's a film that describes two uh, characters in a very poverty-stricken part of China. Uh, the characters are kind of mentally disabled, let's say. But they manage to kind of get together, it's, it's a man and a woman, and, and start to lead some decent uh, life. But then because of uh, the, the pressure of modernization and, and the pressure of kind of uh, avoiding poverty in China and in general, uh, their lives are uh, very hard influenced uh, by, by these policies. And, and yeah, I don't want to do any spoilers, but the, the, the story doesn't end too well. Now, this is a very socially involved movie, and it was approved by the Chinese censor. It got the so-called dragon seal, which is something unique. That, that's, that's the approval, actually. It was screened for a little while in China, and then suddenly it kind of disappeared from uh, the Chinese streaming platforms and, and from the movie theaters. So that's one example how you never know if any topic is sensitive or not. Then there is another movie, which is called The Old Town Girls by the director uh, Shen Yu. And that tells us a story about a mother who lives a kind of extravagant life. And uh, after many, many years, uh, she comes back to the hometown to meet with her estranged daughter. Then they build somehow a relationship, but then they commit a crime together because they need to raise money because the, the, the mother is kind of involved with, with mafia. So, you know, you can see there's, there's a lot of social problems uh, that uh, are being described in Chinese movies uh, generally, you know, like the alienation of uh, children and, uh, and their parents, mafia, poverty and things like that. But then the film, they also got the approval uh, because at the end it is explained that the mother and the daughter were punished for their crimes. It is something that didn't really fit into the story. I got the feeling that it had to be there in order uh, to uh, get the approval. Then uh, my very fresh experience, uh, there was this movie I watched today, just a few hours ago, actually. 
that is called a Disaster Observer. It's a very minimalist film about uh, a woman who is a volunteer who does this like uh, seismologic uh, research uh, in, in mountains somewhere in China. And after a landslide, she's trapped under a fallen building. And she's trying to call for help. And then uh, she's kind of like not getting the help, actually, because the people that rescue her are bound somewhere else. Then she finds out her husband died during the landslide as well, somewhere outside. It's a very minimalistic film. And, and, and you know, you could say that it doesn't really describe like anything sensitive. You know, it's a, it's a personal drama. But at the end, the woman is rescued. And the last part of the movie describes her oath to being a faithful volunteer. And she does that oath in a uniform in front of the flag of the Communist Party of China. I don't even think this part needed to be in the movie. I think it, it would go through the censorship without it. One thing I want to stress here is the freedom or maybe the restriction actually forced nowadays? Or is the self-censorship so strong? Or maybe even the nationalism so strong that the uh, filmmakers kind of do it voluntarily? And that's the question I don't have an answer to. But in, in the case of the last movie, it really didn't seem necessary to involve that last part. It was a good movie, really. Oh, this is really interesting. Well, actually, that brings to mind, uh, you know, Xi Jinping's idea that culture needs to bring in this positive social impact that you go to the cinema or you go to the theater to be a better citizen, to be a better member of the society. So what you said about these films and about these uh, last parts fit in very well with this notion that if you do a cultural production, it needs to be positive and it needs to be educational and it needs to help people finding their place in the society. I wonder if the audience all read it as we do, that these parts are just added. That's really interesting. Yes, exactly. It depends on the audience, definitely, how they actually decipher uh, these uh, messages. And then what is kind of hard to research, but maybe what we still need to research a little bit more, is how much the filmmakers follow this principle voluntarily or not. If this is something really being forced, or if this is something they actually feel they have the patriotic need to do, according to the, of course, principles of Xi Jinping and, and, and the Communist Party of China. And I think this is something, this is something, well, this is my task, something I will have to do in the future. Okay, well, it's a task for all of us, and I, I'm not sure if we can find the answer, but we can definitely try. Piotr, I, I turn to you now because what František said about the film industry and about self-censorship and about the space for self-expression, I guess it also works very well with literature. When you talked to literary critics and to artists, to, to writers, what were your impressions? How are they faring? Do they sort of um, find it easy to interpret what the party wants from them? Do they really want to fit in? What are your feelings? Well, the situation is unprecedented in any sense that it's, it's, it might be the first time Chinese leader put so much emphasis on storytelling as a part of uh, national policy, uh, creating the identity. And this, this China story is a kind of symbiosis between nation and narration. And what I would say is that despite telling China's story well as a kind of mandated policy, you know, we could easily come across uh, stories and, and narratives and discourse, discourses that, let's say, register different realities. And I'm not saying they openly counter this um, party, this official discourse, but they just, they just, I would say that while propaganda and policy government have more like top-down approach, the writers take it the other way around, so they focus rather bottom-up. While we must say that, in fact, the atmosphere is heavier, according to the conversation I had with, with scholars, translators, and, and some with the writers themselves, 
there is a bigger degree of towing the line and it is harder to get published and to publish some topics and the funding the funding which is an important part of uh, of being a writer in China's literary system is limited and all those phenomena existed before the pandemic the pandemic changed changed the market but uh, but only might have like only given the boost to the political climate that existed beforehand right now um Franciszek told us a little bit about some of the topics he found were quite visible in the films of a few recent years topics about you know not being included socially about some challenges connected to the economic situation and Piotr, what do you see as things that are quite visible in uh, writings of, of writers the last few years anything that uh, sort of uh, you noticed especially visibly yes naturally there are many but uh, but if i were to pick some then i would say that middle age slash older age they turn the attention to, to the ruler uh, population and those less privileged and also to this discrepancy between rural life and the city life and the fact that well many places in china they are becoming empty they are becoming wifeless because of sex imbalance and there is there is a growing sense of inequality which goes counter this this uh, so-called great win against poverty that was announced two years ago while the younger generation i would say uh, switches their attention to some new to a search of new new forms of fulfillment in life and in doing so for instance opposing the institution of marriage is one of the examples worth mentioning that is a very bad timing for um, for the party and china's demography to experiment with such ideas but in in resisting this loveless marriages there is there is also some resistance against pragmatism of the older generations that in some way just wanted to get by and now younger offers they find this pragmatism somehow somewhat oppressive and i could also uh, mention science fiction it is definitely worth mentioning for a few reasons sci-fi has been recognized both outside china but also internally and also in a institutional sense as a field worth developing worth funding worth encouraging translators editors from other countries to to build some kind of institutional support around it and the tricky thing about science fiction in china is a fact that the official discourse in china is partly utopian in a sense that there is this constant drive uh, toward progress let's say never-ending optimism about direction the country is heading so the utopian thinking is a part of state policy and state propaganda so sci-fi writers they move away from utopia but not necessarily to dystopian areas they offer different realities in chronological sense in geographical sense and in doing so they offer they offer very different visions of reality now and in, in the future and all that is for literature in a more conservative manner the other parallel world is internet literature which is huge which is marketized which certainly deserves more research but its scope and the pace of development cannot be you know equal with 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 any other literary phenomena that's taking place around the world yeah what you said about the topics of the maybe a little bit older authors who are very much interested in rural china and in social inequalities that actually rings a bell as far as uh, 
visual arts are concerned because many artists are very much interested in rural China and they are very much interested in educating and helping in leveling up the inequalities and this is a trend that has been very visible in, in visual arts in China at least since 1990s so this is something that is pretty strong even until now and naturally there is also this part in between cities and rural areas and I'm, I'm talking here about migrant workers which are also under under the radar of Chinese writers also there is a growing field of migrant workers literature so they they record their own experiences in form of short stories as well as poetry and they are also magazines are being established that are dedicated to their to their work and uh, and and to the writing yeah that's also similar to visual arts especially a very well known female artist wen fang who actually did a huge project on very interesting educational project on on migrant workers right so we have definitely some things in common and you mentioned online or, or internet literature which is a fascinating field and both you and me we had a chance of discussing about this with uh, a well-known Chinese author of internet literature Mr. Yang Hanliang who told us about how huge the market is and how uh, you know enormous the popularity of, of internet literature is and I'm sure you also noticed the, how proud Chinese officials were with the size of the internet literature showing that China is absolutely the world leader in this uh, as far as the scope, the size, the number of readers etc and even equaling it to the Korean wave with uh, K-dramas and K-pop or the Japanese manga. How do you feel about how that fits in with what we do research on in, in, in literature? Because definitely the content of these works is very much different from what we would consider the traditional literature. Well, there are mixed opinions about both quality and relevancy of this literature, whether it accounts for as a social commentary or whether it accounts for any social events in China. Some hold that this internet literature is in fact a form of escapism and a kind of way out for young slash young adult readers. But as, as, as we had a chance to find out some, some social topics or are also mentioned, even though internet literature in a great percentage, you know, is, is fantasy novels and, uh, well, outer world histories. Yeah, I remember that uh, because internet literature is very fast, so you produce things every day, writers write at least a chapter a day, it actually can reflect the social reality much faster than other forms of cultural output. Now, if you do a film, you need one or two years very often. If you do a theatre production, you also need a long time. If you just do things every day, very often you can include things that are uh, sort of discussed in the uh, social media. And this is actually what my impression was, that many of the things that are discussed over you know, social media channels are things that people can relate to. And these things are incorporated into internet literature to make things more interesting for the readers. But this, again, can tell us something about the society and it's a sort of an indirect research on what is on top in public discourse through the social media. So that might be quite an interesting thing also to look at for people who like reading a lot and read very, very fast. Even looking from the outside without actually reading those works can, can, can tell us something about the cultural sphere in China overall. The topic of internet literature is quite often looked down by the scholars because, in fact, the authors are quite often required to churn out like 5,000 words a day. And it's, it's, in many cases, it's about the numbers. You survive if you, if you have the biggest readership or you meet the specific quota. So there's, there's this, uh, uh, there's this feeling that uh, it's not a quality literature or literature takes some time and reflection 
But on the other hand, the fact that it's such a huge market, and in fact, the writers, well, this might be going too far, but they are kind of like factory workers, and you know, that they're working on a factory line, and this hyper fast tempo of this literature and promoting it and producing it reflects something about China, something about the pace of the country, the way it moves into online sphere in all sense. And also worth mentioning is that internet literature is not just novels. It's a starting point for what in China for the past 12 years has been called pun entertainment. So it's a starting point for many other many other mm, cultural services, so to say. So we have dramas, TV series, movies, games, merchandise, and they all start from uh, from those those literary writings published online. Yeah, well, what you actually mentioned now is a very important topic. That it's a very huge market, and the cultural sector in China is very dynamic. And very often when we look at China from the European or the Western perspective, we see censorship, we see political agenda, but we don't see how dynamic the field is. And through the pandemic in our research, we noticed that there was constant development and searching for ways of reaching the audiences, of trying to work with big tech to sort of try to find new ways of presenting cultural productions. So this dynamism is also something that maybe is overlooked and internet literature, like you said, is a, is a very interesting field in this respect. Now let's turn to theatre. And Anna, I would, I would like to ask you, because you also mentioned this in your research, but um, it so happens that you and me are just before our trip to China, we'll be going to probably the most important theatre festival in China with actually quite a long tradition, the Wuzhen International Film Festival. Now, what do you think is the theatre sector now doing in China? How did it sort of manage to find maybe new ways of working with audiences? How is it doing after the pandemic? I don't want to exaggerate, but I think it's thriving. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yes, maybe it's a cliche to say that much has changed, especially in theatre field. But, you know, we usually finish with the statement that theatre artists are stuck at some indescribable point uh, in the theatre history. And we worry a lot as a theatre sector, worry about this, you know, fast paced stages. And we are bearing all these post pandemic uncertainties about liveness in theatre, about uh, being imprisoned in highly mediatized culture. But on the contrary, and I think what is significant here is, um, is that the general landscape of nowadays Chinese theatre seems to become clearer. And maybe because of huge governmental and private sector funding and this highly centralized um, administrative support, I feel like the outlines for its future, you know, has been established. And um, Chinese contemporary theater, especially Hua Zhu, so literally spoken theater or spoken drama with its, let's say, always delayed history. Uh, I think it used this transitional point between two entirely different eras, like pre-pandemic era and post-pandemic era. Uh, I would even call it a kind of uh, intersectional gap between tangible and you know, corporeal theatre and this future theatre that is equipped with haptic systems, with uh, live streaming opportunities, even sometimes game-like theatre. It used it not only to catch up with other players, like Western players, but surprisingly, uh, I feel like it started to to take the lead, especially in terms of significant high technology involvement in theatre. And what we witnessed in the last two or three year period uh, is, the, for example, is the emergence of um, entirely new festivals in, uh, in China, like uh, Arania Theatre Festival or Think Metaverse Theatre Festival or Shoko Theatre uh, Festival. And each of these festivals uh, boasts its own unique characteristics and uh, has its own dedicated audience and very specific objectives. Um, I can uh, give you some examples because I think they can explain this uh, speciality of every festival. For example, one of the distinctive projects of uh, Arania Theatre Festival is uh, 300 migratory birds, where 300 artists 
collaborate intensively for 300 hours and uh, they live together in an artist village. And, you know, this festival not only gives a grant to construct this kind of, you know, random artistic community, it teaches artists how to be highly productive, how to be super creative uh, under limited uh, time constraints, and also how to be creative in site-specific venues, not only in theatre. But at the same time, I feel like it encourages these artists to conform randomly summoned viewers and uh, you know the scope of funding and mentorship uh, provided here is really impressive so it's essentially like incubating the next generation of artists yet the shekel theater festival in shenzhen i think it operates uh, in the same lines and um, this you know incubating the next generation of artists i think uh, it's very important for uh, Chinese theatre now, like this very distant prospect of, of what will happen. And it's worth mentioning uh, that all these festivals completely cross the boundaries between the artistic and the commercial fields. Uh, so it's a notable trend that, you know, this growing commodification of theatre, how to commercialize it, how to integrate it into video games market, how to promote urban development for theatre, how to boost tourism or even uh, theatre tourism. So I think these are the directions in which these festivals are evolving. And uh, the last but not least, uh, at the turn of April and May, the first Sphinx Metaverse Festival was held in China. And that was the festival that absolutely broke the fourth wall of theatre, I think, with its really exorbitant number of tech companies giving its financial and also knowledge support to it, but uh, at the same time having a significant leverage uh, over it. So this festival, I think, tried to somehow incorporate, try to adapt all the discussion connected with Web 3.0 uh, into the realm of theatre. And it also uh, triggered the creative industry workers from very different branches, from very different fields, and uh, summoned the audiences from different fields, like netizens, like cinema goers or computer gamers, so not surely theatre goers. So as far as I understand it, uh, the words common drift in theatre, you know, to take this cross-disciplinary attitude can be much easily deployed in China because it's uh, centralised administration and uh, governing. Right. Well, actually, you touched upon several really interesting things. So maybe let me put them together and, and see whether any of us wants to add anything to that. Well, first of all, you, you underlined how dynamic the field is, and we already discussed this here today that actually you have to be there to see what is happening in culture, in theatre, in other places, because China is just moving really fast and, and we shouldn't forget about it. Another thing that you mentioned, which is really good, is that we very often forget that China is a place where you have the Chinese big tech companies and they are very much interested in culture. So when you mentioned the Sphinx Festival, you know, we have all the players there. Yeah, you have uh, Baidu, you have ByteDance, you have um, Alibaba, you know, working with many different partners and trying to explore how to better reach audiences, how to better sell tickets, how to better show artistic productions, how to mingle art and technology. And this is also something that I guess we in Europe could, could uh, look at very closely and even to find inspirations. Another thing that you mentioned, uh, and this is something that came up with our initial research that we're doing with Professor Ilchuk and, and uh, Tamara Kaminska is the, you know, very sort of perfect mingling of working in culture and uh, selling products that culture is very much commercialized. And this is a very conscious policy by the Chinese government since even the 1980s that they would expect even public cultural institutions to actually work on the market, sell things, earn revenue. And this is something which I think is very particular for China and quite interesting. Frantisek, I'm sure in film, it's very similar. Yeah, definitely. I just, I just wanted to add two things. The commercialization, let's say, you know, the, how the Chinese government, but the industry itself, even without the government, see the, the value in the culture can be maybe proven by Louis Vuitton being the main sponsor of this King of Film Festival I'm actually there right now, you know, like very luxury brand on something that is really art house, 
that is still considered art house festival, you know? So this connection uh, seemed to me uh, very interesting. And then another thing I wanted to mention, and Anna mentioned it uh, as well, uh, is the big support and uh, subsidiaries uh, from the government uh, to the cultural industry. And that is something I think is really a direct cause, or the, the COVID was the direct cause of this thing, that China is investing in their own culture much more. In case of film, those are subsidiaries for cinemas and everything. So, yeah. Yeah, I w maybe I will just add that the money comes from different sources. You have a lot of money from the central government. You have even more money from local governments, but you also have a lot of private money. So when we talked about all the big tech companies, when we talk about other you know, big players in industry, you know, many companies invest in culture. And this is how you can have incubators that Anna talked about. And you have all the things that you know, maybe might be hard in many other countries to come about. Yeah, and it's uh, and, I, and I think uh, it's a lot about uh, using the domestic market. And you know, when I mentioned that the Pinion Festival actually survived COVID, I think it's partly also because that the domestic market is so strong, and that even the authorities they wanted to remain strong as a part of the uh, post-COVID economic uh, recovery process. And this is something that you can't find basically, maybe except for the US, uh, anywhere else in the world to have such a strong domestic power. That actually makes me think that in the field of culture, China achieved two things. One thing is that in the field of culture, China probably managed to successfully implement dual circulation, something that they have big trouble with implementing broadly in the field of, of economy in China. So the domestic consumption is quite, actually quite high. As far as culture is concerned, they don't need to export. Well, they can't really. They're not very good at exporting their culture, but they are very good at consuming it locally. And another thing that I actually go back, Anna, to what you said, is that first China achieved market economy without democratizing, without becoming a democratic country. And now they seem to achieve innovation without opening up as far as social discourse is concerned. So this is another thing that might be really interesting and quite shocking even for us, that you can have a strong authoritarian state, but you still have innovation in the field of culture, even though you have 100% censorship and 100% control. And this is something that from our point of view probably would be very, very difficult to understand. Anna, I want to ask you the question that I asked Frantisek and, and Piotr before. It's about what kind of social topics you expect to see in Wujen. Yes, uh, you know, looking at the repertoire this year, I feel like, I don't want to guess, yes, because you have to have this experience, being the uh, and listening to the audience reactions and so on and so forth. But I feel like maybe grand narratives and uh, this tension between grand narratives versus slight individual ideas, uh, some distinctive thoughts, uh, growing in strength and slowly maturing somewhere in the shadow of the post-COVID reality. So this reality that is uh, standardized, that is unified, that is uh, just said, uh, that is co commodified and product-oriented and globalized. I feel like that might be the directions of this year edition. And, you know, because when I look at the title for the whole edition, which is Arise, with the so short annotation uh, after it, uh, which is Yue Qi Fen Xi, Ying Feng Qi Fei, Mai Xiang Xin De Lu Chang, just in rough translation, meaning jump up, brace up, face with the wind and go ahead, stride, uh, stride toward uh, a new journey. And of course, uh, this Arise uh, can be a perceived as a sort of an order, yes, issued uh, to Chinese society to wake up after a period of, uh, of stagnation, you know, just summoning Chinese people to fulfill their dreams. But maybe, and maybe it is more crucial, uh, it might be also about the whole direction of Chinese theater, yes, because uh, this theater is becoming uh, much more documentary and it's more like forum theater or even environmental theater. So the theater that somehow supports micro narratives, uh, but to give you some more details, yes, um, in this year's edition, 
uh, Meng Jingkui set to present the fourth rendition of the Bad Back. So uh, it's a play originally written by Vladimir Mayakovsky during the late 20s and amidst uh, the backdrop of new economic period. And what we know beforehand uh, is that uh, the play's narrative revolves around uh, one man uh, whose name is Ivan Prisipkin that might be labeled as, uh, as Boschlast in Russian, so a Philistine, uh, a kind of hedonist who breaks uh, a long-term relationship to marry the wealthy daughter of a hairdresser. And just in short, and uh, during really extravagant wedding, a fire erupts and Prisipkin is doused uh, with uh, fire extinguishers and these fire extinguishers uh, freeze him for the next 50 years. And he's accompanied by a tiny bed back uh, frozen as well. And when he awakens, uh, he awakens in an entirely different uh, world. So in a, diff in, a, in a world dominated by communism, where he becomes somebody really strange and he becomes, uh, he serves even as an exhibit in a zoo, completely drunk because people give him uh, loads of beer because are so afraid of him. And uh, this work uh, as an example is entirely ambiguous, I think. It's really, uh, how to say, it, it, it unwinds tides because when I recall some, you know, info uh, from the past, I remember that it was staged in Soviet Union and uh, and that at the time it was directed by Meyerhold and uh, it received really harsh treatment in reviews because in Soviet Union it, uh, it must be like that. It must have been like that. But at the same time, it receives a wonderful reception from the audience because Mayakovsky is somebody that can be really put in the pigeonhole, I would say. Uh, so we may treat Prisipkin as, as ridiculous and as somebody that is bizarre in his posting this newfangled uh, way of life. But this is the one that potentially may bring a change. Yes, he's a simply revolutionist. So here comes the question, yes, which world is better? This communistic world or this previous world and which attitude seems more healthy? So uh, Looking at Mayakovsky's play, I think that Mayakovsky himself doesn't give any simple answer and these two worlds are con constantly merging. And um, I think that the whole thing is about that there are always bedbugs frozen through, through decades and waking up at least just to give up a kind of intellectual counterweight to the to the mainstream. So I think that's the reason why the bedbug has become the Meng Jinghui's very important work, one of his maybe the most important works. And uh, I even call it a kind of, you know, uh, phenomenon because this reflection is is being raised by somebody that somehow monopolized Chinese market, yes. So we have uh, works like that. Then we have uh, another influential director that is a very strong figure, I think, in Chinese theater now. His name is Li Jianjun, and I feel like the last decade uh, is the very peak of his career. For me, the most recognizable of his works are those in which he tries to reverse the theater as a place uh, where professionalism is the greatest advantage, like uh, he tries to reverse it as a, as a holy place, yes. So I, I, for example, I remember one of his latest work titled uh, One Fine Day, where he exactly gave voice to, to amateurs. So the ordinary people recruited from different cities uh, because every single version had the cast from different city. And uh, that what was kind of the community theater, I would say essentially making the mundane meaningful. And in fact, it became a little bit controversial because people started to discuss you know, some things, some uncertainties about the pandemic and start to complain, started to complain, uh, for example, the work uh, conditions, the duties during the pandemic, there were, uh, there was a nurse uh, talking about her duties. So it was really interesting. Uh, but instead of this documentary theater, uh, he also uh, acquaints the audience with some novel literature, like Kafka's Metamorphosis, like Bulhakov's Master and Mar Margaret. And this year he will come back with Lu Xun, which I think is a challenge because there were directors that had to say goodbye to the festival because of, you know, skewing somewhere to the forbidden interpretation of Lu Xun. And of course, Lu Xun is one of the 
most profound of Chinese modern writers, uh, but he's as well, well appropriated by uh, later communism. But at the same time, I think that he's not easy to interpret and always uh, ambiguous and always confronting and always striving for this kind of attentive uh, criticism. So after the uh, adaptation of Diary of a Madman, Li Jianjuan will present during this edition, uh, edition the true story of Aq. And, you know, this is a story about, you know, of course, but uh, to our audience, about an ignorant and uh, uh, constantly cheating and even clownish Aq trying to uh, rationalize his every defeat and call it uh, a spiritual victory. Um, and this is the story uh, somehow, you know, reflecting upon the Chinese society that is totally frustrated, I would say, that is weak, that is humiliated, that is uh, almost unable to act. And But even when acting, acting in a very ridiculous way. So uh, to alleviate th this kind of, you know, misery in life. And that's, I think, after the bed back, another pessimistic story about Chinese society, you know, as a whole. And uh, uh, and what, but what is also ingrained in this narrative here is, you know, is as a small story about a bumbling revolutionist, uh, maybe remaining slavish and weak and dependent, but still a revolutionist. So. Uh, to sum it up, I think that these grand narratives, yes, may uh, play a role. So that's my thought. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you mentioned Men Jinghui. Well, actually, incidentally, he's the guy behind most theater uh, things happening in China. Let us mention just the festival. So he, since the outset, he was one of the founding fathers of the Wuzhen Theater Festival. And then he's been the head of the Beijing Fringe Festival for many, many years. And he's also behind the Sphinx Metaverse Festival that you mentioned before. So he's one of the really important guys in Chinese theater. And when you mentioned Lu Xun's Aku, I suddenly remembered about Kong Yiji, another story by Lu Xun, which uh, created quite a stir in the social media not long ago, when people said that uh, for a young person in China, Kung Yiji's life is the future. They will have no job, they will have no work, they will have no money. So they will end up like Kung Yiji, like an alcoholic who ends up on the street. And it's a very pessimistic view, which goes, of course, counter the whole official narrative about, you know, being positive in China, developing so much. But with a degree, let's not forget that. You know, that's, that's, yeah, that's thank you, Piotr. Yes, Kung Yiji was well educated. And, and so are those young people. So disappointed with with the developments for the future. Yeah, yeah, Anna. And what is interesting for me about this uh, Lao Tzu, so this you know old mentors, old uh, old hands in directing, that we know that uh, they may not you know entirely go in line with authority. Like when we look at uh, these directors' histories, careers, and they some of them even. Uh, experience some kind of con controversial episodes in their careers but since they have learned how to express i feel like they they learned how to express this discord in a more nuanced manner so that's why i think Mujen festival might be a really interesting dialogue platform that all these officials and directors meet to share opinions to somehow negotiate their opinions Okay, Anna, it's good that you are so optimistic. Hopefully, there will be a lot of negotiating and discussing at the Wujan Film Festival. Just to sum up, because we talked about film, we talked about literature and about theatre, I will say maybe just a few words about the visual arts, which is, of course, a huge topic and a huge area, uh, very dynamic in China. It has been a, a, a field of cultural activity where also a lot of money was invested. Many artists became very rich people or going on the wave of popularity. But of course, in our research, we are interested not in who earns big money, but in who uh, creates art that uh, responds to some important social issues. And here, I guess I have maybe three or four topics, which for me are quite important as far as visual arts in China are concerned. The first is that 
artist since already more than 10 years. Many of them uh, get quite interested in rural life, like we said, but in being active changes of rural reality. So here maybe we have the most important guy or most recognizable, Zuo Jing, who became quite famous for his first project, Bishan project, but he did many other things which are similar. So you basically go to the countryside, a very poor area, and you try to activate it through culture, through education, through activities, through rebuilding some of the old uh, spaces, buildings, old functionalities of a society that is no longer there. And there were different responses by local authorities to his actions, mostly negative, actually. But, you know, after the Bishan project, he did lots of other ones in, in Guizhou, in, uh, Maogong, and then in Jingmanshan, and most recently in, in Henan province, in Shou country, and uh, during the pandemic in uh, Dananpo village. So this is one of the, I think, trends where artists want to be socially useful, and they want to do socially useful things. And they are not often uh, recognized by the authorities as socially useful, or they are not understood, the intentions are not understood. And then sometimes it's pretty hard. But this is, you know, we, we can sort of point to this as one of the areas of interest. Another one which is quite similar, I already mentioned the artist, female artist, Wen Fan, uh, working with deprived communities. She did a, a wonderful project where actually since 2009, uh, you know, working with poor children in Gansu province. And she actually did a presentation on this in 2022. And it's interesting but because her partners are big companies from France and foundations. And this project is done together with Dior. So this is another thing. We, we talked about Louis Vuitton. Now we talk about Dior. And um, many artists turn to education. And uh, artists I personally know, many people outside China, I think, don't know this guy. He's called Deng Dafei. And he's been doing wonderful projects with uh, deprived children, very poor children from the outskirts of Beijing, having no access to visual art education, actually giving them access to these things. And this is also a way of artists, you know, showing the usefulness or being practical in what they do. You know, there is this sort of a feeling that, you know, since life is so difficult, let's just do something that is creating a visible value for the society. And last thing is, we talked, I think, František, you mentioned environmental issues. And I think, Piotr, you also talked about this, the, the things connected with pollution, with uh, overdevelopment, costs, etc., etc. And this is also a really important uh, topic in visual arts. And here, probably the most recognized guy would be Wang Zhouliang, who uh, his first or maybe the most recognizable project was called City Besieged by Waste. And actually the issue of creating art from waste is really hot in China and has been hot for, for many years. So apart from him, we have people like Han Bing, Wang Zhiyuan, Xu Bing, Liu Xintao, different artists from if different age groups. But they all work with either documenting waste or creating art from waste. And Anna, when you mentioned the documenting function of theater, that actually made me remember that in visual arts, very often artists turn to documentators. They document rather than create other things. And many artists who started with sculpture, with painting, with graphic arts, they actually turn to photography and they just do photos. There are a lot of people doing photography in China just to document how the country is changing, document different you know, social phenomena. This is something that, that has been quite, quite visible. Okay, guys, we are in the middle of our research going to China, from China. And in the next podcast, I think we'll be going much deeper into the social topics reflected in different areas of cultural activity. Is there anything you want to add to our discussion before we uh, wrap it up? There is one notion I must give credit to William Callahan for that of best optimism and there is, there is no contradiction in being both pessimistic and optimistic about China from the artist's point of view, that they, they noticed the country's great achievement and uh, the work that has been do done so far. But at the same time, 
they notice the byproducts. And this came to my mind when, when we mentioned pollution, which is obviously a side effect of, of, this, of this rapid growth that took place in recent years until now. Mm, all right. Well, something that I think can be a way of summing up our discussion and what we see in the cultural field in China, I don't know if you would agree with me, is that it's a many-faced reality. And uh, contrary to these you know, very popular opinions we have in the West about China, leveling it up and talking just about Xi Jinping, I think there are lots of discourses in China, a lot of people having a lot of things to say. It's only that we need to uh, understand the, how subtle some of the voices are to try to understand what the social discourse in China is really like. But definitely, I see many things that we can actually bring forward in our research, trying to understand what artists are trying to say. Thank you very much for this podcast. I hope um, this is a good start to the second phase of our research. Uh, thank you, Frantisheng, for connecting with us from China. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Piotr, for connecting from the UK. And thank you, Anna, for connecting from Poland together with me and looking forward to our next trip to China. Just to sum up, this research is part of uh, European Union's Horizon Europe research called China Horizons, dealing with a research in China. And what we presented you today is part of our work in Work Package 2, Society and Culture. Thank you very much for listening.